Hello and welcome to Chemix. Today we will be finally synthesizing hydrobromic acid. So here's what you'll need. Here I have 120 grams or one mole of potassium bromide, although you could also use uh, the equivalent of sodium bromide. Then you need 200 milliliters of distilled water. And apart from that, also 90 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid and one or two spatulas of red phosphorus. But I'll explain this later. I've transferred the potassium bromide into the beaker and now we'll start adding the water. I'm going to add a total of 200 milliliters. So in goes the first 100 milliliter portion. And I'll start the stirring. Now comes the second half and I've already used a bit of the water to wash out the remaining potassium bromide out of the container I weighed it in, so we'll now add the rest. And you should note that this considerably cools down the solution, which is actually quite good for us since we need to cool it down anyways. Um, now I'll set up for an ice bath. Now we've set up to add our sulfuric acid. This is the beaker containing our potassium bromide solution and it's sitting in an ice bath to uh, obviously control the heat of reaction because the addition of sulfuric acid will be very exothermic. On top I have an addition funnel containing 93.75 milliliters of sulfuric acid which is the exact amount I have to add since my sulfuric acid is only 96 percent and then I have a thermometer stuck in there so I can monitor the temperature. Right now it's hovering about 10-11 degrees and really just don't let it get too hot or otherwise you'll risk degrading a product since sulfuric acid is actually able to oxidize bromide to bromine so just be aware of that. Okay, what is essentially happening once we add it? Well the stronger acid is able to free the weaker or in this case more volatile acid from its salt form so essentially we're forming potassium hydrogen sulfate and um, our hydrobromic acid. I'll now start the addition and adjust the drop rate so we maintain a constant low temperature and in the bottom right there you can see my thermometer. Okay, so let me get this going. The addition has been going for approximately five minutes now and you can see some faint vapors of hydrobromic acid appear in the beaker. Additionally, the temperature is also slowly rising but you should make sure it stays under 20 C. So if it does get too hot, either add more ice to the ice bath or just slow the addition down for a moment to let it cool back down. We'll continue this and I'm guessing it will probably take an hour, an hour 20 or something. It looks like adding 200 milliliters of water was a little bit too ambitious and I've started to gradually add more water. The problem is that we are producing a lot of potassium hydrogen sulfate which is pretty much insoluble, so um, the moment the solubility is exceeded, uh, it crashes out of solution and clogs the whole thing. My stirrer is not able to stir it up, so here I just have some distilled water, which I'm going to gradually add just to keep everything moving. And the goal is to keep the water we use to a minimum, because it will negatively affect our yield, but um, just add enough so the whole thing stays liquid. After the addition of the sulfuric acid is complete, I let the solution stir for a while longer so it can cool down uh, to the lowest possible temperature so we can squeeze out as much of the potassium uh, hydrogen sulfate as we can. And I don't know if you can see it on the video but there is 
quite a large amount of uh, potassium hydrogen sulfate crystals which are actually surprisingly coarse so um, they didn't clog up the stir bar too much although I did add 30 ad uh, additional milliliters of distilled water so I'll let this cool down and then I'll filter it off the solution has sufficiently cooled and a lot of potassium hydrogen sulfate has precipitated I've now set up for vacuum filtration uh, using a fritted glass funnel and this is actually quite good if you have one because uh, this is a very strong acid and it will essentially eat through paper filters so either use multiple layers of filter paper or use a fritted funnel and this is my homemade vacuum pump which you can see how to make in an upcoming video okay so let's turn the vacuum on and filter this through here's what's left in our beaker and as you can see it's quite a dense mass of crystals and you could harvest this if you're interested in potassium hydrogen sulfate but since sodium hydrogen sulfate is readily available as a pool pH lowering agent I'm not going to bother uh, getting all of this potassium hydrogen sulfate out um, so what I'm going to do is just scrape it off in there, suck all the rest for hydroboronic acid out and then discard the rest this is our filtrate after I transferred it into a 500 milliliter round bottom flask as you can see it's a nice clear amber liquid uh, but theoretically it should be colorless so obviously we have some kind of contamination in there and I guess there are two main reasons the first one being that my sulfuric acid wasn't perfectly pure so that was already a bit discolored and then since sulfuric acid is an oxidizing acid it is actually able to oxidize bromide to bromine um, so some of the discoloration is elemental bromine but we'll get uh, rid of that in a later step so first off I'll set up for simple distillation and we'll distill our product this is my setup for simple distillation on the left here we have the boiling flask containing our mixture of hydroboronic acid and water it's sitting in an oil bath since itself boils over 100 degrees celsius we can't use a water bath so I'm just using regular old frying oil and it's sitting on my hot plate which obviously heats it and I also got a stir bar in there to agitate it to prevent bumping then it goes up here through a very short Liebig condenser but it's totally sufficient for the job since water as well as the water hydroboronic acid azeotrope both boil at relatively high temperatures and then on the right I currently have an Erlenmeyer flask to uh, facilitate all the water that comes over and then once the temperature rises I'm going to switch it out for the 250 milliliter round bottom flask you see in the back there the temperature is also monitored by our digital thermometer as you can see we are now collecting some distillate and this is mainly just water coming over as you can already see by the still head temperature which currently is 101 degrees I'm going to switch out the receiving flask once we exceed the 100 degrees um, by a bit more like 110, 115 I'm going to switch out uh, the receiving flask but it's not too critical since we are going to fractionate uh, the whole thing afterwards anyways so now just wait till the temperature rises and I'll be back the still head temperature has now reached 120 degrees and I'm going to replace the receiving flask for our actual round bottom flask and if you're wondering what the temperature does here uh, it's kind of weird it starts climbing uh, then it holds at a certain temperature and then it starts dropping and it's uh, repeating itself so I don't know what's causing this and it's kind of weird but I'm going to change the receiver nonetheless and as you can see we've collected around 
80 milliliters of mostly water with some HBr in it. And I'm not going to discard this, um, but I'm going to combine all the different fractions um, later on and redistill them. So bear with me and we'll see how this distillation goes. The still head temperature has now stabilized at around 124 degrees. So I'm assuming that right now we are collecting azeotropic hydrobromic acid, uh, which would be the azeotrope with uh, 47, 48 percent hydrobromic acid by weight, which boils at 126 degrees. At least that's what the literature says. So I'm pretty confident we are indeed collecting azeotropic acid right now. We could theoretically switch our receiving flask and collect this azeotropic bromic acid as it's the highest concentration we can get but we'll still have a slight bromine impurity and I want to distill it over some red phosphorus to get rid of that so I'm just going to collect the whole fraction that comes over and redistill it a second time okay so I'll be back towards the end of the distillation the rate of collection has now significantly decreased and the temperature has also dropped to 122 degrees uh, so I'm going to now change the collection flask back to the Olmeyer flask in which we collected the forerun and I'll collect all that comes over till the end and then we are going to purify and redistill this separately from the rest so I'm going to do this right now And here we can have a look at our collected product. I'd say that's roughly 120 milliliters perhaps of pretty pure hydrobromic acid. This is the fraction that came over from 120 degrees up uh, back down to 122 degrees. And it's also pretty clear so it means uh, we did a good job at controlling the temperature since pretty much none of the bromide was oxidized to bromine. So the second purification step is probably not even necessary but we're going to do it anyways. Here's what the remnants in the boiling flask look like. And I distilled pretty much until nothing would come over anymore. Uh, the heating bath temperature rose to about 180 degrees. Uh, nothing would come over so I start the distillation and it does seem that our discoloring impurities concentrated in the boiling flask so they probably weren't bromine in the first place. Anyhow I'm going to redistill uh, the main fraction I received and collect some constant boiling hydrobromic acid. See you in a bit. Before I distill the main fraction a second time, I'm going to add a bit of red phosphorus. And this is to react with any trace amounts of bromine, which is probably unnecessary since our hydrobromic acid is very clear, but I'm going to do it nonetheless. And what's happening is the red phosphorus will react with any, hydro, uh, any bromine to form phosphotribromine, which will then in turn hydrolyze to form phosphonic acid. And when we distill it, the phosphonic acid will uh, decompose, producing phosphine. So do this in a well-ventilated area since we are producing some trace amounts of phosphine. Okay, so in it goes. Try not to spill anything. There we go. And swirl this around. And let it stand for a while. I've set up for simple distillation yet again, and I'm going to redistill this over some red phosphorus to achieve a very pure, constant boiling hydrobromic acid. 
Also, I'm going to collect the forerun in the same Elmire flask that I did collect the fore and after run of the previous distillation, and I'm going to fractionate this later on. So, for the time being, I'll heat this up, and this time I'll only collect, uh, start collecting hydrobromic acid once we've reached a constant boiling temperature, which in my last run was around 124 degrees Celsius. So once we stably reach that temperature, I'm going to switch out and start collecting our product. You can see white vapors appearing in the still head, which indicates that we do in fact have a pretty high concentration of hyaluronic acid already. I'll start uh, collecting this once it reaches a constant temperature. The temperature has now reached 123 degrees and it's flickering to 124 from time to time. So that's fair enough and I'll start collecting our constant boiling product. So I'm going to switch out the receiving flask for the storage bottle in which I plan on uh, storing the hydrogonic acid. So here we go. And now we're collecting are pretty much constant boiling hydrobromic acid. I'm going to stop this because it does let off quite a bit of fumes. And we're going to process this later on. Here's a close up shot of our collection vessel, and you can see the whole distillation apparatus is filled with a thick white smoke. So that indicates we are indeed collecting quite concentrated hydrobromic acid. And next up I'll show you what our boiling flask looks like. As you can see there's a thick crust of red phosphorus on the side of the flask. And that'll be pretty difficult to clean up so I definitely do recommend to let the red phosphorus settle to the bottom first. Then decant it and then distill it. I didn't want to filter it because well, it's pretty hard to clean up and I'll probably never get it out of my frit. So I opted for just distilling and then washing out of the flask. Um, but I think I should have just given a bit more time, let it all settle to the bottom and then decanted it. But oh well, can't help it now. I've set up for fractional distillation. In the boiling flask, which you can't see in this shot since the whole apparatus is too big, I've put the combined fore and after runs of our previous distillations, and I'm going to distill them again. I'm not going to go into too much detail about fractional distillation, since that's for a separate video, but essentially what we're doing is the same thing as during our last distillation. We're going to distill until we reach a constant boiling temperature, and then collect everything that comes over as our product. All the dilute hydrobromic acid that comes over before our constant boiling azeotrope will be collected as dilute hydrobromic acid, which we're going to use for um, analysis or overall reactions where quantity doesn't really matter. So, I'll see you once I've collected this fraction of the product and combined the two so we can determine our yield. Let's have a look at our final yield of hydrobromic acid. On the left here I have 97 milliliters of 45% hydrobromic acid and this corresponds to a 78% yield based on bromine. How did I determine this uh, concentration? Well, I measured the density and then you can go online and you find some charts that tell you which density corresponds to which concentration. And that's how I determined that ours is 45% by weight. And apart from that, we also obtained this, and I guess it's like 15 milliliters of a pretty low concentrated hydrobromic acid. And this is all that I could collect from our fractional distillation. Since it's just so little that I couldn't really separate the two and distill azeotropic acid, so this is not azeotropic. It's also not constant boiling, so it's just some low concentration. So was the fractionate, uh, fractional distillation really worth it? I don't think so. To be honest, you should just discard everything and don't bother with distilling it. Because for like 50 milliliters of low-grade hydrobromic acid, this was a whole lot of work. And I don't recommend you do it. 
that about wraps up this video and as always thanks for watching and like comment and subscribe see you next time Thank you.